with the fundamentals of density functional theory behind us and the rigorous foundation provided by the Hohenberg and Cohn first and second theorems, now we can move ahead to examine how practical density functional theory was implemented relying on Cohn-Sham theory. So the Cohn-Sham self-consistent field approach was what broke the problem of finding trial densities and determining energies from trial densities. And Cohn and Sham proposed a novel trick, effectively. What they said was, imagine that you have a fictitious system. So you can tell they're physicists because they started from a fictitious system, and physicists are very good at that sort of thing. Take a fictitious system of non-interacting electrons. So these are electrons that do not interact one with another. And these non-interacting electrons have the same ground state density as that of the real system where the electrons do interact. Now, because they have the same uh, density, the real and the fictitious systems must have the same positions and atomic numbers of the nuclei. However, the Hamiltonian operator associated with that fictitious system is a very easy one. Since every electron behaves independently, the Hamiltonian is a sum of one electron operators. And the nice thing about Hamiltonians that are sums of one electron operators, they don't have any two particle terms, is that the proper eigenfunctions can be Slater determinants of the individual one electron eigenfunctions, and the eigenvalues are just the sum of the one electron eigenvalues. So the textbook in section 4.5.1, if you want to go back and review it, has a nice derivation of the proper eigenfunctions and eigenvalues for Hamiltonians that are sums of one electron operators. And so if you want to see that in a bit more of an equation form, in 1965, Cohn and Cham said, let's, let's do the following. I know that the energy is a combination of kinetic, nuclear electron interaction, electron-electron repulsion, and exchange correlation energy. So this is sort of everything else. But let's, let's start with the first term, the uh, kinetic energy. So Cohn and Sham proposed, let's get a non-interacting kinetic energy. And the reason that that's simple is that now, if I write the density as a product of orbital densities, so much the way we do in wave function theory, but I will you know, expand it in a basis set as a way to think about it. Well, I will be able to get the kinetic energy of the non-interacting system from those orbitals. It'll just be the sum of all the one electron kinetic energies associated with those orbitals. It's the non-interacting kinetic energy. There's also a Coulomb interaction with the nuclei, and that's pretty easy to deal with. For the electron-electron interaction, I will take the Coulomb interaction of the density with itself. That's that classical interaction. And of course, that brings in a red flag because an electron doesn't interact with itself. And moreover, we're ignoring uh, some of the exchange and correlation in a many electron system. But that's what, and I'll go back a second here, that's what this last term will be for. In a sense, this last term will make up for all of the errors associated with positing a non-interacting system, so that has an effect on the kinetic energy, with employing a classical electron-electron repulsion for a, uh, a charge distribution. We're just going to lump all that into the exchange correlation term. And so this is just a, a different way to write that equation, maybe with a little bit more detail, namely that the energy of the, the real system associated with that density can be computed as the kinetic energy for that density for non-interacting electrons, plus a correction term, I'll call it delta t, for letting the electrons interact. And remember, we've already specified that the non-interacting system and the interacting system have the same density, so it's always density appearing as an argument. Then there is the uh, nuclear electron attraction energy, that's the easy one. Then there's the classic VEE, electron-electron repulsion. And then finally there's this delta V term, this is all the non-classical corrections to the electron-electron repulsion energy. So really this, this uh, way of writing it compared to the last slide just emphasizes that the exchange correlation piece contains within it some kinetic energy corrections as well as electron-electron corrections. 
So how do I go about actually doing this calculation? Well, I will, as always, express my density, or I shouldn't say as always, but as in wave function theory, I will express my density in an orbital basis set. So I'll have some basis functions. Here I've decided to use chi. And the density at any position in space will be the sum over the, uh, the occupied orbitals, chi squared, at that position. And so if I integrate over all space, I will get a kinetic energy component over occupied orbitals. I'll get a nuclear attraction component over occupied orbitals. And these look, these terms are identical to what you would get in the Hamiltonian from wave function theory if the chi are the occupied molecular orbitals. And then there are these remaining two terms. These are slightly different. So this is integration over all space of the density interacting with the orbitals that define the density. So now you see why this has to be done self-consistently. So I don't know what this density is until I have these orbitals. And each time I get a set of orbitals, I'll compute a new density, and I will drive this to self-consistency to the point where the solved four orbitals chi regenerate the density I was using for their interaction. And of course, this is the classical interaction, so now I need the exchange correlation piece, which also corrects for uh, interacting kinetic energy compared to non-interacting. So the simplest functional that you might imagine, and uh, Conan Sham discussed it as well as von Barth and Hayden in 1972, is the so-called local spin density approximation. And sometimes people don't use the S in there for spin, they just say local density approximation. And it says, well, I will get my kinetic energy in the cone sham way for non-interacting electrons. I'll do classical electrostatic repulsion and the attraction to the nuclei. And then I'll integrate over space the density interacting with an exchange potential and a correlation potential. And what potentials will I use? Well, I will use the uniform electron gas. So that was the one that both Slater and Dirac worked with. And I mentioned uh, Slater did a derivation whereby alpha comes up one in an equation that was in an earlier lecture. With Dirac, it's two thirds. And so if you plug in two thirds, you will discover that the actual functional form for this exchange correlation potential is minus 0 0.73856 times rho to the one third power. So this is a pretty trivial thing to do to just integrate over space the density times the density of the one-third power, a few constants out there, and poof, you've got the exchange contribution to the exchange correlation potential. And for the same uniform electron gas, you can fit a correlation energy functional that you get by having done Monte Carlo simulations on that gas, including electron correlation. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But in any case, this is a local approximation because the exchange and correlation potentials just depend on the density at a given position. So that is a local property and you are integrating over space. So these, these tricky terms, delta T and delta V electron electron, are all contained in this exchange correlation energy. And I, I just keep saying this because I want you to have a feel for what's in there. So there's quantum mechanical exchange and correlation. There's correction for self-interaction energy. There's correction for the difference in the kinetic energy between a non-interacting system and a real one. And in the end, what we're doing is we want to find orbitals that minimize the energy and subject to a, an eigenvalue equation. So we have these cone sham operators, one electron operators, that have eigenvalues. And these are the orbitals that are the eigenfunctions. And what's the operator? Well, it, it looks vaguely similar to a Fock operator. There is a kinetic energy component. There's an attraction to all the nuclei. There's a repulsion with the density, and that's, again, why it's self-consistent, because it's from the orbitals I get the density, so I'm going to have to keep iterating through until my orbitals are converged. And finally, there's this exchange correlation piece. And what is the exchange correlation piece? Well, it's the partial derivative of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the density. So that's called a functional derivative. And we don't need to worry too much about what a functional derivative looks like, but suffice it to say, you can do functional differentiation and come up with a form to put into uh, an operator. All right, so 
insofar as the energy from equation 13 is exact, because dft is exact in its derivation, these orbitals, chi, must provide the exact density. So the minimum corresponds to the real system. And the orbitals uh, can be used then to form a Slater determinant a wave function. So this Slater determinant, that's what this ket means, when evaluated for the sum of all the individual operators, just gives you, it's an eigen, eigenvalue equation, so here's the Slater determinant appearing again, the sum of all the orbital eigenvalues. All right, so the first term on the right-hand side of equation 14 to compute the kinetic energy of the non-interacting electrons, so it's, it's just evaluation of the del squared operator. We get the ks orbitals just the way we do in MO theory. That is, first, we pick some basis functions that we're going to expand our MOs in. We need the coefficients of those basis functions, and we determine the coefficients by solving a secular equation, and it's just like Hartree-Fock theory, except instead of having elements f mu nu in our secular matrix, we've got k mu nu. So the f mu nu elements had this same one-half del squared, they had this same attraction to nuclei, and then they did something a little different here. There were some j and k-like integrals, some of which would have appeared within here, some of the j's, but they, they don't have this exchange correlation potential. So the difference between the Cohn-Sham matrix and the Fock matrix is really contained in the last two terms. But in any case, we're going to uh, diagonalize that determinant in order to get energy eigenvalues. Each of those eigenvalues will determine a unique set of coefficients for a unique orbital, and we're going to fill our orbitals according to the usual Aufbau principle. So let me uh, close this section by talking about some of the similarities and differences, which I've, I've tried to highlight as we've gone along, but now I just want to really focus on that. So what are the similarities between Hartree-Fock theory and Cohn-Sham theory? Well, one similarity is they both have a variational principle, so they're common in that regard. A second similarity is the kinetic energy and the nuclear attraction uh, matrix, pieces of the matrix elements, are identical for K, the Cohn-Sham matrix, and F, the Fock matrix. And uh, this really led to implementation being relatively straightforward in existing quantum chemistry codes to put DFT in. You were really calculating many of the same integrals. So if the density in the classical interelectronic repulsion operator is expressed in the same basis functions used for the KS orbitals, then you would get four index integrals in k as well as in f. And let me just go back one to, to emphasize that. That is, if I write this row as a, as a product of basis functions, so remember that in the Fock matrix there's sort of this mu nu on the outside, and then there'd be a lambda sigma in here. Well, if I do that to express rho, I'll still have four index integrals, and I don't really get a time savings. But I don't have to do that in this case, because I don't have exchange integrals. That is, I'll never be integrating over a mu and a lambda for, uh, for variable 1 and a sigma and a nu for variable 2. So that'll become more clear later if that's not uh, immediately obvious here. But for now, let's just say it was possible to implement it in the same way that Hartree-Fock theory was done. We still need a density in order to compute the secular matrix elements. So remember, there's a density matrix in Fock matrix elements, and there's going to be a density here in Cohn-Sham matrix elements. Uh, the density is determined from the orbitals that are part of the solution of the secular equation, so that's why it's a self-consistent field iterative procedure, and as I've, I've said up till now. So modifying the existing codes uh, to perform DFT calculations was reasonably easy to do. Now, what are the key differences? Well... DFT, at least as we've derived it, contains no approximations. It's exact. The only approximation I've talked a bit about is LSDA, using the local density approximation as an expression for the exchange and the correlation energy. If you just describe the exchange correlation piece uh, abstractly, it's an exact theory. It's when we have to actually plug something in when we need to know the exchange correlation energy as a function of rho so that we can take a derivative to get the exchange correlation potential, that's where we start introducing approximations. So Hohenberg-Cohn prove that such a functional exists, but we have no idea what it looks like. 
So in a sense, you could say that Hartree-Fock is an approximate theory, right? We deliberately accept that we will not have electron correlation properly. But the equations that drop out of that approximate theory can be solved exactly. DFT is a little bit different. It's an exact theory, unfortunately an abstract one, and we have to solve the relevant equations approximately because the form of the operator is unknown. So exact DFT is variational, but when we introduce these approximations for the exchange correlation energy, that's not necessarily true anymore. We still uh, always adopt a variational principle to optimize orbitals, but there's, there's not a guarantee in the absence of exact DFT. Uh, however, a nice feature of both exact and approximate DFT is that they're both size extensive. So remember, size extensivity is this property that, uh, put simply, if you have two copies of something at infinite separation, the energy you compute for that ought to be double the energy you would get for simply computing one copy. And DFT satisfies that, and it is size extensive. All right, in the next series of videos, we will actually start to uh, come up to the modern day and look at how functionals uh, that are being employed now are put together and what their utilities are.